Euh, bonsoir. Euh, nous allons reprendre par la seconde session euh, de cette journée. Euh, pour ceux qui n'étaient pas là euh, en début d'après-midi, bienvenue euh, et merci d'être là. Euh, aussi, pour ceux qui n'étaient pas là, euh, sachez que cette manifestation est entièrement bilingue et euh, globalement, chacun parle, enfin bilingue anglais-français, je précise, hein, et chacun parle dans la langue qu'il souhaite. Euh, et il y a une traduction simultanée. Euh, il y a des casques qui sont, je crois, vers là-bas, euh, sur le côté. Voilà. Euh, Lucie lève la main, euh, c'est là-bas. Euh, donc la première partie de cette session euh, va être en anglais. Et la deuxième, session, la deuxième partie de la session sera en français et en anglais. Euh, on a deux formats euh, différents euh, pour euh, cette Excellent. session. Un format de conférence avec Bernd Scherer que je vais bientôt vous présenter et un format plutôt de conversation, de panel euh, que, euh, avec Bruno Latour, euh, Frédéric Aitwati et Jamie Allen. Euh, je ne sais pas ce qu'il va sortir de ces conversations ou de la conférence de Bernd, que je n'ai pas lue évidemment, euh, mais euh, l'idée de cette session c'était d'inviter euh, des personnes qui euh, ont pour habitude de déporter la théorie les idées, euh, la philosophie, l'anthropologie, que sais-je, la pensée, euh, hors de leurs espaces habituels, le livre ou la salle de classe, disons, euh, dans les espaces plutôt publics de l'art, euh, les musées, euh, le théâtre euh, et d'autres formats d'assemblée. Euh, C'est pour cette raison que j'ai voulu inviter euh, Bernd Scherer, euh, qui est à ma gauche, qui dirige la Haus der Kultur der Welt à Berlin, euh, qui est un lieu dont nous avons parlé déjà pour ceux qui étaient présents en première session, un lieu assez passionnant euh, qui, euh, une fois Bernd m'avait dit, nous faisons, mais peut-être il le redira, euh, de la curation d'idées euh, dans leur propre fabrique. « Curating ideas in the making uh, » was a quote. Euh, donc, euh, Bernd euh, a euh, un, euh, une activité euh, que j'estime être une forme de recherche-action c'est un théoricien dans la pratique, c'est un théoricien qui produit à la fois des concepts pour la Haus der Kultur und der Welt et qui réfléchit à comment les rendre publics. Or, comment les rendre publics, c'était aussi le titre de la grande exposition de Bruno Latour, « Making things public » en 2008, je crois, 2005, pardon, 2005. Euh, par ailleurs, je voudrais dire que les connexions sont fortes entre les quatre euh, intervenants de ce soir, puisque à, à la hausse der Kultur und der Welt, certaines des problématiques que traite aussi Bruno Latour dans son œuvre philosophique ont été abordées, comme l'anthropocène, par exemple, ou les questions autour de la technosphère. Et euh, Frédéric Aitwati et Jamie Allen, qui euh, ont leurs propres œuvres, sont euh, des collaborateurs euh, réguliers euh, de Bruno Latour. Donc, euh, on commence avec la conférence de, de, de Bernd Scherer euh, pour environ 45 minutes de questions et réponses comprises et on enchaînera, on aura une petite minute, 5 minutes de break pour euh, réorganiser les tables et on enchaînera sur la conversation. Euh, bonne session. Thank you very much, uh, Lionel. And uh, first of all, let me thank to you for this uh, wonderful invitation to be here at uh, the place uh, which is inspired by Kata Atia, uh, an artist I admire, and we had uh, at the house a few days ago uh, on, on the project of the Dictionary of Now, uh, which was just explained. And I'm also very happy to be in the same space uh, with Bruno Latour uh, this, this afternoon, and you will see uh, uh, how thinking is resonating, and to some extent, in the thinking uh, of the house. Um, I will not go to speak about Donald Trump, <laughs> but he is there. This photo, you just see here, is taken by Armin Linke. It was the first image you saw when you entered the Anthropocene project of the HKW. It is an irritating photo. It is referring to things which it hides at the same time. It brings objects in interplay which belong to different categories and reference systems. Doing all this, it destabilizes our view, but it puts it into motion as well. What is happening here? All parts of the space in this photo are made by humans, but there are no humans. They are outside of the picture. 
What we see is a photograph taken from the Museum of Babylon. At the wall, which is a kind of frame, we encounter images of the Tower of Babylon. It is a construction of this tower which led to one of the first deep experiences of transformational shift in the consciousness of our societies. In the ancient Middle Eastern legion, the failure of constructing the tower divides society which loses its common language. Beside the images from the Tower of Babylon, there is an object in the frame of the wall which belongs to a completely different category, namely an air conditioner, a US American product with the trade name General. It does not refer to a past of thousands of years, but to the present. It is an important import of the West as the museum is it belongs to. Its task is to stabilize the climate in the room and thereby the conditions of the other objects in the room, especially the images with which it shares the space of the wall. But how does it do this? It is now that the third dimension of the photo of Armin Linke comes into play. It is a dimension which is referred to by the cables entering the wall, thereby referring to an invisible space behind the wall. It is a space where our Babylon takes place, the drama of our time. The cables lead to the power station, which transform the energy resource of the region, the oil, into electricity. In between the power station and the oil coming out of the earth, the refinery is placed. Refineries played a major role in the strategies of the Islamic State, to which also the city of Babylon belonged to. Because it is exactly the refinery where the transformation of deep planetary time into human time takes place where the resources of the planet are transformed into the mobility and speed of our century. That means the photo of Linke relates in the third dimension, the museum space, to the whole infrastructure of the Anthropocene, which fuels the speed of our contemporary life, but which are at the same time the centers of the new wars. In their stability, these infrastructures seem to belong to the world of the Holocene. But in their back, the instability of the Anthropocenic world is lurking. From today's perspective, the kind of destabilization provoked by the use of fossil energy belongs already to the past, the 20th century. To understand the dynamics of our days, of our days we have to take a closer look on what is called digital capitalism. It is this kind of capitalism which leads to a complete implosion of our classical notions of knowledge and the world. In, pra in brackets, if this has not been successfully done already by Bruno Latour. In short, in the past, the pre-Anthropocene era, we had problems understanding the world. Today, we have problems living in a world which we have created. The paradoxes of knowledge have been transformed into the paradoxes of life. Or more precisely, we have made them such. And in the course of this development, the concepts of knowledge and of life changed profoundly. In order to understand this shift, let me start with the classical paradox all of you know. The Greek philosopher Zeno tells the story of the tortoise and Achille as a paradox. It seems impossible for the fleet-footed Achille to overtake the tortoise. Whenever Achille reaches the tortoise, who had a head start, she is a step ahead once again. Achille can close the gap until it is infinitely small, but can never catch up with his opponent. However, the whole audience knows from experience that Achille can effortlessly overtake the tortoise. With the classical paradoxes, contradictions arise between abstract thought and reality. 
It is a time when the natural environment is looked at as a stable world to which the thinking has to adapt. Only in today's world, because it's permitted by technologies, we encounter paradoxes in our living environment which are themselves a product of our thought. The important point here is that the technologies we have created are the outflow of our thinking, our consciousness. They are artificial objects. That means our environment is progressively cha shaped by materialized consciousness. And it is by no means any more stable. It is constantly transforming. This is especially the case with the mechanisms of the digital world, which may serve here as an example for the technosphere. Initially, the recording of data and its algorithmic processing was designed to improve and sometimes to control the lives of individuals and societies, making them easier to organize and to control. However, by feeding back into every area of life, these systems are now de facto shaping life itself. How paradoxical situations occur and what logic governs them, one can study in one, uh, in one of the examples most of you know. A man walked into a target shop outside Minneapolis and angrily criticized the strategies of Target. They had sent his daughter advertisements for maternity clothing, nursery furniture, pictures of smiling infants, and coupons for baby, for baby clothes. The daughter, he argued, is a teenager and still in high school and should not be encouraged to get pregnant. The manager apologized. A few days later, the manager called the father again to apologize. Now the father reacted somewhat abashed. Quote, I had to a talk with my daughter. It turns out there has been activities in my house I haven't been completely aware of. The daughter was pregnant indeed, and the market research company knew it before she had told it her parents. Target had developed a new method of consumer tracking with the help of the statistical genius Andrew Pohl. Pohl identified 25 products that when purchased together indicate a woman is likely pregnant. Target used this information to send coupons to pregnant women at an expensive and habit-forming period of their life. What happens here? A certain time in the life of a person which is characterized by all kinds of emotions, aspirations, lived relationships, is reduced to 25 products. In order to correlate this part of life with the consumer goods the company is selling. This information is abstracted out of an extremely complex social context, but is then infused in it again. What takes place here is a flattening of categories. Intuitions, emotions, goods are fused together on one categorical level in order to correlate them. In classical logic, this is called stratification. In the data system of target, pregnancy, which can mean an endless number of things to an individual person, is these 25 products. The basic commodity of this new kind of capitalism becomes our activity. It is a colonization of social relations and actions. On the surface, it seems that digital capitalism reinvented the wheel, promoting an economy which does not need any more material resources. But de facto, the material resources are we. And the basic operation in which this is done is the following. Dividing social life into units, separating these units from their original context of meaning, and recombining them by the power of algorithmic machines in order to produce something new out of these abstracted units, which you then feed back into the social process. The refinery 
has been replaced by the infrastructure of the digital world. In order to understand he, what is happening here, I would like to invoke the image of a cat organ, which the French writer Jean-Baptiste Weckerlin describes in his book Musicania, which he published in 1877. In, in the passage of the book, he describes the visit of the King of Spain, Philip II, to Brussels in 1549. Quote, and I show you a picture now. <laughs> this is uh, technology. Uh, quote, the strangest part was a card that carried the most singular music imaginable. It held a bear that played the organ. Uh, this is uh, translated here in a, not a bear. Uh, instead of pipes, some 20 boxes, each containing a cat whose narrow tail came out of the bottom and was connected to the keyboard by a string, so that when a key was pressed, the corresponding tail would be pulled hard and would produce a lamentable meow. The historian Juan Cristobal Calvet noted the cats were arranged properly to produce a succession of notes from the octave. This abominable orchestra arranged itself inside a theater where monkeys, wolves, deer, and other animals danced, danced to the sounds of this infernal music. But this is a more humanized uh, project already. The cat organ is creating music on the basis of a construction which separates each cat from its natural environment by putting it into a box. This corresponds to dividing life into separate units. And these boxes get organized in a way which corresponds to the recombination of data that something new, namely the music, is created. The music is a product of the recombination of the individual reactions of the cats to the separate acts of torture. The meaning which the whole theater is evoking in the audience is separate from the actions, the meows and experiences, the pain of the animals behind the scene. The only operation you have to do now is to replace the cats by us. On the basis of what I have developed so far, I would like to argue the following. The dualism of Descartes, distinguishing between res cogitans and res extensa, was instrumental to the development of the last 300 years. Already before Descartes, thinking was distinguished from the material world. And the material world was used by humans for different purposes. But Descartes turned thinking, which was before understood as an action onto an object, in an object res cogitans. Thereby, he created a mental ontology which was separated from the material world. Thinking was not anymore an action on and related to an object. It constituted an object world in itself. This had far-reaching consequences. On the one side, it provided a categorical frame, a mind map, which divided nature from man in such a way that it allowed humans to treat nature as a pure resource. And doing so, it transformed nature during the last 300 years, especially during the big acceleration fueled by fossil energy, the deep time of the planet, in a way that it was absorbed by human consciousness. Nature was translated into culture. It was a culturalization of nature in the Descartes paradigm. The Descartes paradigm was, so to say, the frame for this. In the last decades, a second process started to accelerate, especially by the means of digital capitalism, namely the transformations of human action and life into commodities. And that means the naturalization of culture. Also for this move of equalizing 
categorical differences, Descartes had laid the grounds by ontologizing mental actions. In the mind map of Cartesianism, this means that the modernity project, which it triggered, is characterized by the permanent transgression of categories. In its performative mode, it functions as a trickster. And the object which it uses are monsters in its own terms. Monsters are basically composed objects composed out of different categories. The finance market today is, in this story, the most important trickster we know of. What does this mean for the arts? In order to answer this question, we return to the photo of Armin Lincoln. Oh no, sorry. Go back. So. Uh, which, uh, the photo which connects us with the foundations of civilization as we know it in Mesopotamia, Babylon. The story of Babel in the Bible is a story about the origin of culture out of committing sins. A story which started with the loss of paradise. The connection of the tower marked a point in history where humans had started to build urban environments. This meant that they were able to coordinate actions in social units which transcended the survival mode of hunters and gatherers. The new forms of cooperation provided a power which, according to the story of the Genesis, triggered in humans the desire to build a city and a tower which touches the sky. Then the reaction of God is revealing. He sees in this construction of the tower only the beginning of a process in which humans may become almighty. That means similar to himself. In order to prevent this, he confuses the one language and disperses humans over the earth. In this sense, the Babylon story is a story about the creation of oneness and its destruction by God. By dividing humans into different okay. Sorry. Thanks. By dividing humans into different groups, communities and societies. There is not any more one worldview, but different ones. Being part of a whole is replaced by the experience of something which is outside of us, which cannot control cannot be controlled and we have to deal with. The stability of the whole is replaced by the instability of a diverse world, the borders of which are in flux and have to be constantly negotiated. It is the experience of the world between 2000 and 600 before Christ, <coughs> stretching from the Mediterranean to Mesopotamia up to the Indus Valley on the Indian subcontinent and to the Caucasus in the north. It is a world of city-states which started to trade with each other and are connected to hinterlands which provide important resources such as metals and minerals. It is a world where the power gets concentrated in each of the urban centers but where the larger environments, especially the hinterlands, are out of control and the relationships between the city centers are unstable. How did people deal with such a world where borders were insecure? They created a world of counterfactual images, which represented spirits meant to protect them. And here I refer on the work of David Bengro, The Origin of Monsters, Image and Cognition in the First Age of Mechanical Reproduction. For this image production, they combined forms referring to different categories, humans and animals. One more. Ah, okay. and that means they created another world of spirits by creating monsters. Take, for example, these mold-made terracotta plagues, 
with images of protected spirits from Azur and other Iraq. In some cases, a whole militia of monster images or figures serve to protect the houses from intruders such as epidemic diseases. In other cases, Uh, the depiction of harmful demons, such as this child devouring Lamashtu figure, travel over land and sea to the borders. In later centuries, these monster images also travel between city societies as gifts and counter gifts in order to stabilize the exchange between the different cities. In some cases, the representations of the counter world are used to translate possible conflicts of the physical world into the realm of other, otherness. Then, since this whole imagery served to deal with and partly to control the outside world, be it spiritual or physical, be it local or translocal, its creation was directed, directly related to power. It was a symbolic power which the states tried to manage by a complex cultural apparatus. This cultural apparatus administered the occult knowledge, knowledge as well as the stores of exotic and magical materials. There existed exact descriptions of ritual practices in which monsters were created, of the material and the tools to be used. Quite often the materials such as precious stones, were imported from faraway hinterlands and treated by silver and golden tools. To summarize, the major task of the cultural apparatus at that time was to provide and control the knowledge and the media for the construction of the counter world, a non-factual world animated by monster figures. And it was the role of those counter world to negotiate the borders in a world of deep transformations, characterized by developing urban spaces and a kind of cosmopolitan relationship between the city-states. Against this historical backdrop, the challenge of contemporary cultural production becomes clear. In the antique world, the space of the counter-world were separated from the physical world and guarded as a kind of holy space. In today's world, we have either dictators which suppress the creation of counter-worlds or a capitalist system which is constantly searching for new perspective. Whereas dictators cannot deal with difference, the capitalist system lives on it. Capitalist production, and especially digital capitalism, is hungry for difference. It needs it for its dynamic. It eats it up by commodifying subjective perspectives, turning them into goods. And it is, it is a voracious machinery. What is the role of the arts in this world? As a starting point to reflect on this question, I would like to take a work of Kada Atia. The work consists in writing with white chalk on a white wall the sentence, resisting is to remain invisible. Resisting is to remain invisible. In writing this system, a sentence, one contradicts its meaning to some extent. Since it articulates, and that means makes visible, the invisible. This, I would like to argue, is exactly what art today is about. The articulation of the invisible. Searching for the ephemeral, the neglected, the outskirts, and bringing them into light, what is neglected. It keeps the wound open which the mainstream creates and tries to camouflage at the same time. Oh, come on. Now we are returning a third time to the photo of Armin Linke. 
It confronts our gaze with a lost space. We look into a museum without people. We are in northern Iraq. The image confronts us with a desert of modernity, of Western modernity. Museums in the 19th century were part of the nation-state project meant to stabilize the imagery of the citizens. In the Middle East, the Western import of nation-states is imploding. Linke's photo captures a moment and a scene which can be read as a counter-image to the purifying project of the nation-state. In portraying the museum space as a messy situation, which mixes objects of different categorical systems, such as the AC, the painting at the wall, and the armchair, and as a space where the major actors, namely humans, are missing, it presents a monster. Looking at this monster, we experience a blow which goes through this world. And it's not only the world of the Middle East, it is our world the photo is looking at, but from a neglected space in northern Iraq. I mentioned at the beginning that the Linke photo was at the entrance to our Anthropocene exhibition. The Anthropocene project was a project by the HKW, the House of World Cultures, which brings into the question what is the role of a cultural institution at the time of monsters and tricksters. The monsters and tricksters are not anymore in the counter world, they are producing our world. My answer is, it should provide a space for developing counterfactual worldviews by exploring new frames. The Anthropocene project was designed, and I mention now three projects, if you are interested to get to know more, or perhaps some of you know the projects. Uh, of course, I can explain, but I just want to make one point clear. The Anthropocene project was designed in exactly this way. Its objective was to create new constellations for reconstructing temporalities, agencies, in order to reorganize knowledge systems. In my discussion of the Linke photo, I used the expression in the desert of modernity, very consciously, because there was a project, the desert of modernity at the house, which took place a few years ago, and was looking at the modernity project from the former colonies in Africa, and thereby reframing the space of the modernity project. In the animism project, we were reading the modernity project through the eyes of a concept meant to describe pre-modern societies in relating technological and psychic processes in a way which we was literally eye-opening. The project demonstrates how these concepts are still at work in the modern world. They only organize a different kind of material. The Potosi principle by Kreischer and Siegmann was looking at the interaction of global flows of capital and image production from the perspective of the silver town Potosi in Peru, which was one of the richest cities in the world of the 17th century. These are all example, uh, examples which reflect global developments in taking a position at the margins, be it conceptual, be it geographical. This position at the margins allows to throw light on the inherent contradictions and antagonisms which are inbuilt into the machineries of global capitalism and its anthropocenic transformation of the planet. In the conceptual development of the HKW, the second move was of outside, uh, utmost importance. Being neither a classical art institution, such as a museum or gallery, nor an academic institution, such as a university, it was building on its tradition of the post-colonial discourses and started to question the terms inbuilt in the hardware of the institutional apparatus of Western modernity. We did this in developing concrete practices which allowed to recontextualize existing discourses to resituate these discourses within a sensorial environment. 
For example, in the opening of the Anthropo uh, Anthropocene project, we grounded these courses on social, geological, economical, and technological developments in an island topography. It was introduced by a quote of Gilles Deleuze, quote, islands are either from before or from after humankind. It was a topography which decenters these courses, invites to reflect the perspective island from which you are speaking and finally ask for relating in a non-linear way your position to others. Speakers were asked to bring an object to, uh, to, an, to the island in order to relate their discourse to the material world. In one of the islands, the island Techne, scientists were confronted with... Oh, oh. excuse me. I, I, I'm <laughs> So I understand that half of the discourse you missed? Or? Um, okay, sorry for that. In one of the islands, the island Techne, scientists were confronted with a being, the movement of which was oscillating between human, machine, or animal-like appearances. The performance, I give you a picture of that. The performance of Saville Roy was not illustrating machine, animal, or human behavior. It draws the gaze of the viewer in a process of permanent transformations. Destabilizes the look because the categories for judgment get fluid in front of the eyes of the viewers. Saville Roy had taken on the role of a trickster. The trickster is a spirit of disorder, constantly transgressing boundaries. We know from cultural history that at the beginning of the Neolithicum, in the hunter and gatherers communities, the environment was so unstable that the counter world was not constructed by images of monsters, but it was constantly performed by tricksters. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bernd, um, for this lecture, uh, which has given us mainly the background of the conceptual frame uh, displayed at the Haus der Kultur und der Welt. Uh, so we live in the time of tricksters. And uh, I've noticed uh, during your lectures, your, your lecture, that, and it's a thing that I have noticed uh, coming to the, going to the hack of it, uh, uh, that your especially interested in the infrastructures and this non-visible world. Um, maybe could you speak now before opening the Q&A moment to the, to the audience on how do you work at the hack of it, uh, especially in conceptualizing uh, these uh, big frames uh, like the Anthropocene, the Hundertjahrgegenwart, or the, uh, the technosphere, or uh, nervous systems, or uh, how does it work? Because we have this discussion previously uh, during, uh, after Olga's uh, talk, uh, but maybe it could be interested, interesting for the, for the audience to speak about this institution on a more practical way. So, so to give the pragmatics behind the yeah. ideas. Uh, no, uh, I mean, basically you probably will imagine this. Um, we, ha we have uh, four curators at the house, uh, and uh, the four curators and me and uh, some other people of the staff are basically uh, meeting once a year for a longer time to discuss the issues we, the house should work, uh, work about. And then uh, we define these themes, and um, then we get people to research on them for a year, more or less. <laughs> Um, and then the basic uh, challenges, and this I try to scrape, uh, describe in the paper, is um, to, to find a perspective, to find a point of view which is outside of the mainstream of the discourse, mm. Mm. but is some brings into light mm. the, the, the main discourse. Mm. Uh, so, and then try to frame it. So 100 years of now mm. is exactly such a frame, mm. uh, thinking our, the contemporary 
through the eyes of 100 years and uh, defining then concrete themes uh, where we try to reconfigure the knowledge production around these themes. Mm. For example, the Wohnungswagen. Mm. Mm. Or for example, uh, perhaps uh, one could mention that related to the, um, to the uh, project, uh, the nervous system. The idea, one idea behind the nervous system, uh, and Olga mentioned that, uh, uh, made a side remark to that, was um, to look how social processes in the last hundred years were uh, categorized, systemized, and quantified before the digital world started. So to look at uh, what is uh, uh, challenging us now in, uh, from the logic of the last hundred years, what were the deeper processes behind, behind this, and then to trying to reconfigure the situation we are in at the moment. Okay, I have three brief questions. Uh, first of all, um, we've heard from your lecture and uh, that uh, the history of the, of the house uh, came from a kind of post-colonial view uh, to a more um, infrastructural approach of the world. So uh, would you define this movement as the, the history of the HKV? The second question uh, uh, to before opening the, the question to, to the others, uh, is um, you, you've spoken about the two institutions, the museum and uh, the university. Uh, I know that you, have, you, you, have a, you, you, you do a critique of these two institutions, not as an institution, but uh, what is exactly the factory of knowledge that we can encounter in the house that we can't encounter in these two other institutions. And third, uh, personally, and, and I open the question, personally, um, you're, you've been grounded in philosophical education. Uh, are you still uh, considering yourself as, I don't know, philosopher, theoretician in, in the making or uh, we can hear from your lecture that it's good to have a philosopher directing such an institution, but uh, what is your, uh, uh, what are you, uh, okay. Uh, you, you have uh, to help me because yeah. these were all big questions. The last one is the easiest one. Okay. Uh, I would say all this good philosophy is related to a practice. Mm. And uh, in that sense, I consider myself as a philosopher mm. and the practice is what we are doing. Mm. Uh, so uh, this is the easy one. Uh, the second one uh, is also not so difficult, perhaps. Uh, I think the uh, related to the um, to the academia or to the university, and I, I speak now in general, of course, not uh, related to individuals in the university. Um, our big advantage is that uh, we don't have to take into account, or we have, we take into account disciplinary knowledge, but we have not to perform in the limits and borderlines of disciplinary knowledge. Uh, and this is a big advantage, because I don't have to justify constantly in a certain kind of disciplinary uh, uh, frames what we are doing. So you are tricksters. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Tricksters from the point of view of disciplinary yeah. knowledge. Yeah. Yes, mm. exactly. That was also my point with Descartes. Mm. I mean. mm. Okay, um, so th th this in relation to, um, to, the, uh, to, to academia. Yeah, in relation to the arts, uh, I think the major point is uh, that we are able, and since we are state funded, uh, not to look at the art market. So, art market is not interesting. I mean, we know what's going not, on there. It's not an issue for uh, It's not an issue. We don't have to take into account how do I get this artist and with what kind of gallery I have to work uh, to get this, mm, mm. get this done. Uh, I mean, these are first answers. Mm, One mm, can mm. go into detail. The first question, uh, of course, this is conceptually more challenging. Uh, to, to which extent, I would argue that uh, um, we took the post-colonial phase of the house on board, mm. but are not anymore working in the post-colonial frame. Mm. Um, and the, 
I, I try to illustrate that with the housing mm. uh, problem. Mm. Uh, the, the housing issue uh, was uh, at the core a project about Berlin. Mm. Uh, but what was interesting with the housing issue in Berlin is that it, on the one side it's a completely local issue, who is your neighbor, mm. whom do you meet on the street, mm. and on the other side it's at the same time exactly also a global issue because the housing market is more and more governed by global capital. Mm. So uh, housing is a commodity and is dealt with uh, in the city of Berlin. So here you are in a situation where the global and the local is completely uh, uh, um, intertwined. intertwined. Mm. And what is, was happening was when we started this housing project, uh, that was in 2013, mm. we were tackling exactly this, uh, mm. this point. Uh, what does it mean to live in a city which is globalized by capital? Mm. And then in 2015, when we realized the project, the re refugees from the Middle East mm. were coming to Berlin mm. and were seeking uh, houses, housing. Mm. Mm. So what happens was that on the other level, the, the, so to say the colonial, because mm. the implosion of the nation state in the Middle East is a uh, of course, uh, uh, is part of the uh, uh, history of Europe, mm. the colonial history mm. of Europe. And so, so the colonial came into the city mm. uh, again. Mm. And uh, so you had with this issue of the housing um, and the way uh, we, uh, we decided with who, which groups we were working mm. was exactly on the basis, I would say, of the post-colonial issue who has the power mm. of definition. And we were looking for the people at the margins, for example, the older people, mm. students, migrant people, mm. who were uh, uh, confronted mm. with the housing issue. So the translation of the post-colonial issue of uh, who has the power mm. was translated in new categories. Mm. And th that is what I mean. We took the post-colonial debates um, or the post-colonial thinking mm. into our practices. Mm. Um, on peut ouvrir un temps de, de questions en réponse et uh, vous choisissez la langue qui vous va. Du, si vous posez une question en français, il faut juste qu'on ait un casque pour Bernd uh, qui puisse comprendre les questions. Uh, yeah. um, you translate it, French? No, no, we have a headphone for you. I hope so. Je voulais vous demander quelque chose à propos de votre usage de la notion de capitalisme. Est-ce que quand vous dites capitalisme, vous entendez la propriété privée du capital ou autre chose éventuellement Et une deuxième question, si on est à l'époque du capitalisme numérique, est-ce que tout ce qu'on dit, et ce que vous dites vous aussi, et un discours qui est produit par cet environnement et à, auquel nous donnons voix malgré nous, ou c'est un discours qui est produit, et, comment on peut dire, et malgré et, le capitalisme numérique, et comment on fait pour produire des discours antagonistes au pouvoir actuel Bon, que vous avez, avec laquelle vous avez introduit votre discours. Merci. Did you get it? Yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, for this question. The, um, I don't know if I understood all the po uh, aspects you would like to touch, but uh, what I tried uh, to hint at uh, in, the, in the presentation, or what my thinking is on, on, the, on the question is, the, the problem with digital capitalism, as we know it, is uh, that you don't get out of the system. Because whatever you do, whatever your antagonism you create, it seems that this is exactly wanted by the system. So it integrates uh, this, this, pers uh, this perspective. And then the question is, 
and, and what I see at the moment, uh, and I do not have a really big utopia for you or how to deal with this, is basically what Kada Atia with his um, work is referring to, that you only can create minimal spaces for uh, kind of freedom, kind of counter perspective. I don't see at the moment, let's say, a social theory or um, a macro uh, um, uh, uh, politics which is, could uh, get rid or overtake or being even antagonistic in the sense that it is confronting the system in a, in a deeper sense. It's, it's, I can see it only on individual or small group scales where kind of yeah, uh, uh, spaces are created. And uh, th th there I see really the role of culture and art. Is there another question? Um, so, Oh, so uh, we have may, may, maybe you were asking who are the actors? No, I think oh. the, the, the question is, uh, is the capitalism in your words uh, the production of capital? Or is it something else? Yeah. Est-ce que c'est ça? La, the property of capital. The only, the property of capital. Or is it something else? <laughs> uh. No, I, I, I would say uh, still uh, there are actors behind the capital. Uh, and uh, uh, so to some extent one can identify, I mean, the companies uh, who are uh, driving the system. Um, uh, we all know them, Google, uh, Facebook, and so on. They, they are driving this system. Um, si, on pas, si vous n'avez pas d'autres questions, on va essayer de rester dans notre timing, ce qui est toujours très agréable, de rester dans son timing et, euh, et passer à la deuxième séquence euh, de la soirée. Je, je vous demande juste cinq minutes le temps qu'on réorganise euh, la salle et je demande à, à, aux personnes un peu techniques enfin, qui s'occupent de la technique, est-ce qu'on pourrait relever l'écran et installer euh, trois tables ici pour euh, la conversation euh, J'en profite pour remercier Bernd Scherer pour son intervention et euh, sa disponibilité.